بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا وعظيمنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفع نفوسنا أب القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين وأصحابه الغر الميامين الحمد لله الذي جعلنا من المتمسكين بولاية سيد ومولاي علي بن أبي طالب الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله أما بعد يقول الله في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اليوم نختم على أفواههم وتكلمنا أيديهم وتشهد أرجلهم بما كانوا يكسبون The first of our salawat in honor of رسول الله محمد صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم The second in honor of Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa al-Humma The third with your loudest voices in honor of the Imam of our time Imam Sahib al-Asri wa al-Zaman Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa al-Humma Respected scholars, brothers and sisters Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Discussion concerning Islam and organ donation is a fundamental discussion within Islamic law. At the same time, it's a discussion that has ethical as well as theological implications, as all three are without a doubt intertwined. A discussion that requires a thorough examination, for the discussion is not one which is only historical, but is also one which is seen as being contemporary, and that arguably one of the most asked questions in the Muslim community is are we allowed to donate organs? Yes, you find today arguably one of the most meritorious acts within the religion of Islam is the act which is seen as being the act of donating an organ. And in society as a whole, you find that one of the most meritorious acts in society in general today, that if a person fills out an organ card, for example, or an organ form, you find that that person is revered as being someone altruistic, someone who's looking out for the common good, someone who's looking out for their brethren within society. Because naturally we find that within our own communities and outside of our communities, there are people who require a heart, there are people who require a kidney, there are others who require different organs in order that they're able to survive, both young and old, Muslim and non-Muslim at the same time. So therefore you find that today humanity agrees on the importance of donating an organ, on giving that organ either in one's lifetime or indeed after one's death. As in, in one's lifetime you may find that your wife, for example, requires a kidney. One of the most altruistic things that you could do is give that kidney or towards a son or a daughter, for example. Or you may find that you want to give back to humanity at large, so you decide that in your will, you're going to make it clear that I want to, for example, be a donor. I want there to be a transplant that does take place even after I pass away. People ask the question, well, what's Islam's opinion on this? As in, does Islam unanimously accept the donation of organs? Because sometimes when we read the books of law, we find differences of opinion. You find one scholar, such as Sayyid al-Khoi, may Allah bless his soul, say something such as, for example, you're allowed to donate organs in your lifetime and after your death. Whereas you find Sayyid al-Sistani, for example, says you can donate in your lifetime, but finds major problems after one dies. Yes? So you find, why is there a difference of opinion? You look at someone like Sayyid Fadlallah as an example, who had clearly said, 
that you can donate in lifetime and in after death as well as to Muslim and non-Muslim you find that here someone asks how comes he allows to Muslim and non-Muslim whereas others say a Muslim should come first and a non-Muslim should come second then you have other issues for example if a child dies do the parents have the right to donate the organs of that child you find that for example Sayyid Sistani and Sayyid Al-Khu'i may say no that the parents have no right whatsoever that was the child's organs it's the child's decision whereas someone like Sayyid Khamenei may turn around and say that no the parents are the guardians they're the ones who can dictate whether those organs are allowed to be donated so people look at these different rulings and they come up naturally asking the question that A, what is involved in finding what could be Allah's law? You see, maraja are not giving you God's law. They're telling you what could be God's law. Hence why they are known as a mujtahids and then marja. Every marja is a mujtahid. But not every mujtahid is a marja. Yes, when you say someone's a mujtahid, it means that they've reached a level where they can derive from the sources these sources are what? Either scriptural dependence or non-scriptural dependence. So if I find a law from scripture, that means that it's a scriptural dependent law. Yes, it says to me the law that after Shahar Ramadan ends, you can't fast. Yes, Eid, you cannot fast. That's in scripture. Non-scriptural dependence are what? Are when I'm using my rationality, yes, because aql plays theoretically, and I underline theoretically, a major role in Shia law. Yes. Mustaqallat aqliya, mustaqallat ghair aqliya. These, some of these rational conclusions are based on the Quran and Sunnah. Others may not be. But you find that when a mujtahid reaches the level of ijtihad, yes, that we have maybe hundreds of mujtahids in Qum and uh, Najaf, for example. But we have a few maraja. Someone says, how comes we have so many mujtahids and a few maraja? A mujtahid has reached the level where they can derive law for themselves. Yes, they can tell you. Through what? They can tell you what God's law could be. And Imam of Ahlul Bayt tells you what God's law is. There's the difference. Yes. A mujtahid tells you what God's law could be. I've struggled through the Quran. I've struggled through the Sunnah. I've struggled through the ijma' of the ulama of Ahlul Bayt, the ijma' of the Imams of Al Muhammad. And I've come to this conclusion. That this is what the ruling is. But I don't need to do taqlid of anyone. I'm a mujtahid. Yes, I've reached that level where I'm professor of law. A mujtahid who publishes their manual is a marja. Not every mujtahid decides to publish his rulings. Yes. There are some mujtahids who say, listen, I don't want to be a marja. They say that there are some great scholars in Najaf. I don't want to mention their names. They've passed away now. They never announced their marja'iyah. They were mujtahids. And they would have been the greatest marja'iyah. But they felt, you know what? This is enough for me. I don't need the pressure of 300 million people following me. Yes? I will be able to deduce law for myself. So, people ask, how do these mujtahids and marja'is reach a conclusion like this? So how do they know? Why do they ask this? Firstly, they wonder, are our marja'iyah talking to doctors or no? Are they talking to physicians or no? Because today, the field of biomedical ethics is a huge field, yes. IVF, abortion, euthanasia, the brain dead, all of these areas as well as organ donation all come under biomedical ethics. It shows you how law and ethics are intertwined. Law, the philosophy of it is what? To protect one's life, honor, intellect, property, and religion. Ethics, if we were to take a Descartian view, or take a Kantian view, or take a Sartre view on ethics, we'd come to the conclusion that ethics either is a social responsibility on all of us, or that ethics, there are mutual agreements between us as human beings to ethically be good with one another, or for example, we should feel sorry for one another. I see someone needs a heart transplant. I should have that sense of sorrow for them. I see someone, for example, who not needs a kidney. I should feel that sense of sorrow to support them Law and ethics are intertwined. You can't have law without discussing the ethics of the time. So, you find people ask the question, Awa maraja, say Ayatollah Sistani, may Allah lengthen his life. Or for example, someone like Ayatollah Khamenei, 
Or others, someone asked the question that Sayyid Khamenei said, Sistani, do they speak to doctors or physicians when they come to a conclusion? One of the best books I've ever read. May Allah lengthen the lives of, uh, may Allah lengthen the life of Ayatollah Muhsini. Yes. Ayatollah Asif Muhsini, the great Afghani scholar. He has a book called Al-Fiqh Wal Masail al tabiyya Yes. Fiqh and what? And the questions in medicine. He looks at all the questions which physicians, which doctors ask related to medicine. Yes. He looks at them to show what? To show that when we're reaching a conclusion as mujtahids or maraja, we're looking at the hadiths of the imams of Ahlul Bayt, looking at the Quran, but also trying to see if we're able to look at the medical conclusions of the time. Someone says, why do we need Quran and Ahlul Bayt? Let's just use science. Science is not uh, infallible, yes? Science is fallible. It's always open to developments, open to evolution, and we agree that we should use science, but don't take it wholeheartedly that science gives you every answer. It's always a new and improved science, yes? Every few years there's a new improved. So you need a combination between the Quran, the Sunnah, the Ijma, the Aql, and at the same time using science, using scientists, as Einstein would say, religion without science is blind and science without religion is lame, yes? Both of them need to go hand in hand with one another. So the first issue is people ask, and you find Ayatollah Muhsin in his book, Al-Fiqh wal Masal al tabiya answers this. Secondly, with organ donation, were there any heart transplants or kidney transplants in the times of the Imams? No, there wasn't. So now what do we do? In the time of the Ahlul Bayt, you don't have Imam al for example, say, bring everyone to the hospital, we're going to do a heart transplant. So now how do we find whether it's permissible or no? Because we face a problem, amputation of a body, versus saving one's life. Major tazaham if ever there was one in the principles of jurisprudence, yes? What do I do now? I have one law from Imam al-Sadiq saying that you can't amputate a body. Another law from Imam al-Sadiq saying you have to save someone's life. Now what do I do, Imam al-Sadiq? This is where you branch from fiqh to usul al-fiqh, yes? Fiqh, yes, you'll have the laws, but usul al-fiqh, what's the interpretive methods in reaching these laws? How do I reach this conclusion if there's a clash? Imagine I see someone in a swimming pool of my neighbor. They're drowning in the pool. I know it's haram for me to go into the neighbor's house without permission. But I know that I have to save someone's life. It's a clash. And so that's the second issue that the third issue that is faced in the issue of organ donations. I'm trying to show our youth and our elders when a marja gives an opinion don't straight away say ah, these people don't know we're living here we're much more bright and modern do you know how many things you have to go through before you reach a conclusion look at all of these a third thing when i'm looking at the hadith of imam al-sadiq there are words imam al-sadiq used have they evolved now or no what do i mean for example the word apostate in the time of ahl al-bayt the word apostate could mean someone who truly was a Muslim, left Islam to cause trouble for Islam. Today, an apostate may be a Muslim who leaves Islam but doesn't cause any trouble. He remains a good human being but decides Christianity is his path and the Quran says, لا إكراه في الدين Yes, there's no compulsion in religion. That person is not causing any offense to Islam. He just says, listen, for me, Islam is not the religion. I want to move on. Now, if there's a hadith that says, from, uh, we look at the apostate that you may be able to take from the apostate, you can't take from the apostate, an organ, what do we do? What's the apostate then? What's the apostate now? Again, these terminologies mean that it becomes extremely difficult for us to reach a conclusion. And that's why when you look at Sayyid Khamenei, when you look at Sayyid Sistani, you look at Sayyid Fadlallah, you look at Sayyid al khui you look at these maraja, when they come to the issue of organ donations, it shows you the beauty of legal discussion within the school of Ahlul Bayt, yes? The school of Ahlul Bayt, these scholars, these jurists, yes, these jurists do not come and tell you straight away organ donation halal because what do people want as an answer? They just want Sayyid Ammar to sit here and to say, listen, organ donation is halal or it's haram and let's go home. It doesn't work like that. You go to study law at Harvard, how many years does it take you before you understand the philosophy of law, let alone precedent cases, yes? You don't just go and study law and then come back and say, well, that's the conclusion. No, you as a marja are trying to find what could be God's law. On the one hand, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows you're struggling to find his law. On the other hand, the community has to appreciate your struggle. Yes, 
That's now when Sadi Sistani says something, don't think Sadi Sistani just came out from his pocket and said this is the conclusion. If Sadi Sistani said Al Khui differ, some people say, well, why do they differ? Why don't I, I go to a hospital? I ask this uh, doctor who's a cardiologist, he said, what do you think about my heart? What's your conclusion? He says, this is what I think you should do. His best friend in the same ward, I go and ask him, he tells me this is the conclusion. They're both top doctors. In a hospital in New York, yes, but they come with different conclusions. The point being one, the point being that the issue of Islam and organ donations, when people want a straight, easy answer, it's not as easy as that. There is A, constantly scientific evolution. B, we have to deal with the clashes of the hadiths of Ahlul Bayt. Clashes such as you can't, for example, amputate a body versus you must save a life. Now, what do we do when there's a clash like that? See, Ahlul Bayt tell us you can't harm yourself. Now surely, if I want to donate an eye, yes, if I want to donate the eye, can I donate the eye if I know it's going to cause me long-term damage? Interesting, Sayyid Fadlallah's opinion on this issue. In contrast to others, I'll come to all these opinions, inshallah, very shortly. And that's why we focus on the opinions rather than the personalities. Please listen to me on this delicate point before I go into my introduction. Why personalities? Stop looking at personalities as followers of Ahlul Bayt. Look at their opinions, yes. I don't have a problem with any of these personalities, yes. These are jurists in the school. I want to look at their theories. Great people study theories. Shallow people study personalities, yes. Look at their theories, try and understand their theories. Don't take sides. Now our mosque today, if you follow Sayyid Fulan, you go to that mosque. If you follow Sayyid Fulan, you go to that mosque. If you follow Sayyid Fulan, you go to that mosque. Look at the opinions of all of them and evaluate. That's free, tolerant, open-mindedness. And that's what Ahl al-Bayt wanted from all of us. Therefore, let's examine in the following stages. Number one, what are the rights and responsibilities that we have in relation to our organs? And especially, what did our fourth Imam say? Is the right of our stomach, the right of our tongue, the right of our private parts. Number two, can our organs speak on the Day of Judgment? And what does that say about our responsibilities with them? And how does the eye and Surah Yasin prove this? Number three, amputation of the body is if it's not allowed, then how can someone donate an organ? If clearly Ahlul Bayt have said you can't amputate. Number four, can you donate to a non-Muslim? And what is said for Allah's opinion as to why you should donate to a non-Muslim? Your organs... And why do other maraja say no, for example, in terms of giving Muslim the preference and then the non-Muslim? Number five, what if it's causing harm to yourself? And what are the three categories of harm within the religion of Islam? Number six, what are the other areas that may be examined in the future within the school of Ahlul Bayt in the maraja? And number seven, if the body parts can speak on the day of judgment, then what hadiths mention which body parts speaking on the day? And who does this refer to? Let's examine this and dissect this topic in complete depth. As we know, the difference between human rights and Islam and human rights at the UN is what? We all respect the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, no doubt. As long as they respect it, we respect it. Yes. You find someone asks the question, does Islam talk about human rights? Yes, but Islam talks about human rights uniquely. Normally, human rights are what? The right of your fellow citizen, yes. The right of your neighbor, the right of your religion to practice. But never do you see human rights in Western thought looking at the right of the stomach, the right of the eye, the right of the tongue, the right of your private parts. Islam is the only religion because of Al Muhammad. Salawatullah wa salamu alayhima. Islam is the only religion that you find that says your body parts are part of human rights. Yes. Why does Islam say that? Because if you let the human only respect his neighbor, it doesn't mean that the human has respected themselves. Yes. I can respect my neighbor, but not respect my stomach. Yes. You've seen the Muslim community when they let that stomach out. There's no respect there. You find, for example, I can respect my neighbor, but doesn't mean I'm respecting my eyes. I can respect my neighbor does not mean, for example, I'm respecting my private parts. Islam is the only religion through one text, Risalat al-Huquq of Zayn al-Abideen. Yes? In my opinion, the best book to give to a non-Muslim, Risalat al-Huquq of Zayn al-Abideen. Not the Quran. Quran, even the Muslim doesn't understand it, let alone the non-Muslim. 
In terms of Nahj al balagha you need to be an unbelievable historian to understand the context, let alone if you want to read it in Arabic, that's a different league of a human being. But what's the best to give to a non-Muslim? The best is Risalat al huquq Because Zayn al abidin what he does, after Karbala, he feels people have neglected the sacred body and soul that Allah gave them. And so he writes Risalat al huquq the treaties of rights. Within there, he doesn't just say right of God or the right of your neighbor or the right of your father or mother. He mentions all of these. But he does something different which Western society never does. And that is... That even your body parts have rights over you in Islam. The mind of Zayn al-Abideen was to say, for example, the right of your ears. Someone said, what? You're telling me my ears have rights? Listen, if there's an imbalance in here, you're lost in life. Yes. Anyone who's had that football smash his ear will know it's a dizzy period for the next few minutes. Yes. The structure within the ear. And that's why Imam Zayn al-Abideen says, the right of your ear is that you recognize that you don't allow that which is wrong for you to listen to. Because whatever you hear in the ear goes directly to the heart. Why is music seen as haram? You know, sometimes people say hip-hop, R&B. Honestly, said Ammar, the words are nice. Well, look at the guy reading them before you tell me the words are nice. And look at the video and not just that, your ears, they're not yours. Allah gave them to you. So ask Allah what's nice to be listened to, yes? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the right of your ear... Is that what? Is that to know the messages that you are allowed to enter go to the heart? Have you noticed? Sometimes with Quran, we don't memorize. But with music, it sticks here. Play it anywhere and straight away you see the person reading it. Like he's a canary walking on the earth. Yes? So the ear has rights, for example. The stomach has a right that you watch that haram doesn't enter it. Someone says, but it's my stomach. No, 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 no. Allah gave you the stomach. You're a custodian only. Nothing more. And Imam Amir al says, don't let your stomach, do not make your stomachs graveyards for animals. Yes. Try and look after your diet, look after your balance and so on. The, pri the private parts, they also, they have rights over you. You don't commit zina. There are ways to do things in halal, but you do not commit adultery. You find therefore Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what was he saying through Zayn al abidin Imam was saying each of these organs, before you decide giving them, not giving them, First, know your rights and your responsibilities with them. Yes. There are many out there who tell me, I can't concentrate on salah. Well, then reflect on the way that you've looked after your, the rights of your body. Have you honored your stomach with halal or haram? Have you honored your ears with halal or haram? Have you honored your private parts with halal or haram? Zayn al Abidin talks about the rights of the private parts. Someone will say, Astaghfirullah, you can't talk about these things on member. No, I can't. Let Zayn al Abidin do it. Yes. Allah, we made our religion so backward and Ahlul Bayt made it so forward. Yes? We made cultural taboos, which meant no one was interested in Majalis anymore. And Al Muhammad took us forward. We took the culture backwards. Imam, a thousand years ago, was talking of these rights. That every body part you sin with will speak on the day of judgment. That's why in Surah Yasin, Allah says, in Surah 36, verse about 65, اليوم نختم على Listen to what the Quran, uh, Surah Jasin says. That day, we're going to seal their mouths. They've talked enough. We're going to let what? Their hands speak. And we're going to do what? Let their feet tell us where they stepped. That day, you went to a club and you never asked Allah for forgiveness. And you go clubbing constantly. But in Muharram, of course, Allah is asleep. You know, Allah is awake, so we all become religious. So, when those days you used to go to the club, the feet will say, you know, the feet will say, he walked to a club. Yes, he took me to a club. You walk towards areas of haram. You walk to go and smoke the drugs with your friends. You walk to sit in a gathering and backbite. Likewise with the hands. Find so many emails. Is masturbation halal? No, it's not. It's haram. And you can laugh on these issues. These are fiqh issues. Clearly, Imam Amir al muminin so many hadiths, one of the most despicable acts in Islam is masturbation. Quran said, your hands will speak. You think you can hide from the community? Allah will reveal on the day of judgment. Not your mouth. You've already spoken too much. Yes? Allah will reveal by the sinner. Now, these refer to who? Those who sinned and did not do tawbah. Those of us who've done tawbah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all forgiving. Yes? He recognizes that we sometimes don't sing things shaitan whispered. 
As long as you don't do it again, not I say astaghfirullah and I keep coming back to it. Because then I've not honored the haqq of the body Allah gave me. Yes? Ahl al-Bayt said, these hands, tukallimuna aydihim, tashhadu arjuluhum. Their hands will speak. You say, look at your hands, you're thinking, how's this hand going to speak? No. Because Allah wants to remind you that you lied so much against me, I'm going to let the hand do the testifying. Yes? You can't testify against your own hand when your hand begins to speak. Someone said, but how will Allah raise the body like that? Quran said, مَنْ يُحْيِي الْعِظَامَ وَهِيَ رَمِيمٌ قُلْ يُحْيِيهَا الَّذِي أَنْشَأَهَا أَوَّلَ مَرَّةً they asked the Prophet, who's going to raise this dead body? Now it's powder, the bones are powder. He said, the one who created it in the first place will create it again. Yes? Allah will create your body again. But this time, everything will testify. Therefore, you found Ahl al-Bayt had made it clear. The first part of understanding the organs was that you have, they have a haqq over you. Don't abuse this haqq. You see, I could be a zalim li nafsi and I can be a zalim li ghayri. Zalim li nafsi, what does it mean? Zalim li nafsi means I oppress myself. Forget oppressing others in the community. Sometimes when I neglect the rights of my hand, the rights of my feet, my feet weren't created to go and do haram, to walk in haram. My hands weren't created, for example, to come and touch those who are not mahram to me. Every week I get on my website an email. Am I allowed to hug my cousin? Every single week. It's simple. It's haram. You're married to her? then hug her as much as you want. If you're not married to her, these hands will testify. I touched the body of someone not mahram to me. But Sayyid Ammar, she's like my younger sister. Keep that to yourself. You see as your younger sister, keep her. Ahl al-Bayt say, the fiqh says, cousins, male, female, haram, let alone non-cousins. You, know, you see someone who's not your cousin at a wedding, and it can be difficult sometimes because there are some who are known as huggers, yes? There are some from a mile away you could tell they're coming. You're like, uh oh, it's him. Uh oh, oh, it's her. They are hug central, mashallah. Yes. I wonder what the 12th of Al Muhammad says when he sees this. Wallah, I wonder. Your hands will speak. Someone says, but this is a minor sin. Ali ibn Talib says, the biggest sin is the one you think is minor. Yes. The one you think is minor because why do I say this, my dear brothers and sisters? Not that I don't like hugging. Well, I'm Iraqi. I hug more than anyone on this earth. We kiss everybody. But because of what? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, that's the haqq of your arms, your hands. You don't put them on someone. And therefore, what do you find? Ahl al-Bayt made it clear. The haqq of the hands were clear. The haqq of the feet were clear. And on top of that, they said, therefore, those who mutilate a body, that is the most disrespectful thing to do. I remember Ibn Muljam, Ibn Muljam when he struck Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen, Imam al-Hasan asked him, he said to him, Dad, what should I do to him if you pass away? He said, son, if I die, you strike him with one strike. That's it. Look at this man's conduct. Ali ibn Abi Talib, I tell you. Ali ibn Abi Talib, his conduct is something else. Anyone else would have said, torture him, kill him. No, Ahl al-Bayt did not want him. And then what did the Imam say? That Rasulullah said, don't mutilate the body of a rabid dog. Yes. A dog with rabies. Don't even mutilate that body. Ahl al-Bayt never wanted to see a body mutilated. Because to them, that's the most lowest that a human can go to. And that's why arguably the lowest moment in Islamic history was Muawiyah's mother in Uhud. Yes. And they try and make a million excuses for her. She had started the battle. She had bought Wahshi, the spear thrower. When she bought Wahshi, the spear thrower, she bought him. She said to him, listen, at Badr, I lost my father and my brother and my uncle to Muhammad's army. Today you come in Uhud, I want them finished. He said, who do you want finished? She said, I want Muhammad finished. He replied to her by saying what? He replied to her by saying, okay, and who else? He said, Ali and Hamza. He said to her, describe them to me. She said, Muhammad is the prophet. He said, okay. And Hamza, he said, Hamza is a ferocious warrior. He said, Ali, he said, Ali, son of Abu Talib, he's uh, about 25 years of age. Yes? He said, very well, leave me to the 25-year-old. Came in the beginning of the battle, he came out. He came back to her a few moments later. He said, there's a problem. He said, what is it? He said, as for Muhammad, it's impossible to kill him because there's too many men around him. You're not going to get a spear through there. They're all standing around him. 
As for Hamza, I think I can kill him, yes? Because when he fights, the stance is too open. You could get the spear through. As for the son of Abu Talib, it's impossible to kill him on a battlefield. She said, what do you mean? He said, he will never die on a battlefield. And subhanAllah, he never died on a battlefield, did he? He will never die on a battlefield. She said, why? He said, how many spears I've thrown in my life? He said, I've seen something in the son of Abu Talib I haven't seen ever before. The spear I threw from behind him, just before it came to him, he caught it. And he turned around and he gave me a look. Said, I am never going near him again. I'll take out Hamza. He took out Hamza. After the battle, she came to Hamza's body. Yes. When she came to Hamza's body, she ripped open the body, chewed the liver of Hamza. Say the Zainab said to Yazid, how can I expect some, uh, com how can I expect compassion and sympathy from someone whose grandmother chewed the liver of the noble and was born from the flesh of the martyr? She then made a necklace with Hamza's body parts. Do you know who else she mutilated? Jabir bin Jabir's father, Abdullah al Ansari. Yes, you know Jabir bin Abdullah al Ansari. His dad, richest man in Medina. She went to his body, she cut it open. At it. This is what you call cannibals, don't you? Call them cannibals? No, 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 no. Only Islamic history calls them later Muslims. That's, that's our disgusting history for you. And we're meant to be proud of it. A cannibal? You normally incarcerate them, don't you? You put them in prison, never let them out. No, Hind becomes forgiven. So you found that that mutilation, that they made clear, is haram. And that's why they asked Imam al-Sadiq, Ibn Sinan, Safwan, companions of Imam al-Sadiq would come to him. Imam, what is the situation, for example, with someone, if there is a beheading? He said, we don't allow beheadings. Cutting the hands, cutting of the hands is not allowed. For example, other parts of the body, are we allowed, for example? He said, no. Amputation is not allowed. You cannot cut the head. You cannot cut the hand. This is something forbidden within the religion of Islam. If that is forbidden, then someone asks, if Ahlul Bayt don't allow the cutting of the hands, don't allow the cutting of the heads, Surely, this is an indication that organ donation cannot be allowed. Why? Because organ donation is going to involve an operation where you're going to cut the body. Ahl al-Bayt are against what? Amputation. They're against mutilation. So if they're against both of these, that means that Ahl al-Bayt will never allow such a thing. You find the ulama, what do they say? They say, no, there are exceptions to these rules. What are the exceptions? The first exception, for example, if a mother dies and the fetus dies, you can have an incision. Look at the difference in the terminologies, yes? Amputation, or for example, the amputation that takes place, that is known as qat. Whereas you may have what? You may have a shak that may take place. One is what? One is the mutilation or amputation. The other is an incision. The difference in fiqh here, yes? Let me give you another example. Someone dies because they swallowed something. The thing they swallowed is your property. They got it from you in ghasbi. Are you allowed to make an incision to get that property out? Yes, yeah, certain ulama allow that after that person has died, you can make an incision. Why? Because the ulama say what? They say Ahl al -Bayt, when they prohibited the cutting of the organs, it was in relation to what? In relation to making fun of the body, playing with the body, mutilating the body. Hind wasn't going to help humanity when she ate Hamza's liver, was she? Hind was trying to play with the body of the uncle of the Holy Prophet. Ahl al-Bayt, therefore, you find the ulama saying what? Ahl al-Bayt in certain areas, you find that the imams of Ahl al-Bayt make it clear that there are times when an incision can take place. And there are other times where they talk against the cutting of the body. The times they talk of the cutting of the body is when? That is when you come and you mutilate a fellow human being's body. That's never allowed in Islam. But about making an incision, is that something which is allowed? Yes, that is something which is allowed. And that's why you find when someone like Ayatollah al-Khu'i, may Allah bless his soul, Ayatollah al-Khu'i says that organ donation in lifetime or after death is allowed. He has a discussion, which all of you can go into, the difference between the minor and the major organ. Yes, the minor organ, according to the scholars, he says that organ that can regenerate itself, you're allowed to donate. The one that, you can't, that can't regenerate itself, you can't donate. Yes, 
Whereas after death, he allows for the organ donation. Someone says, how come say the Sistani, who doesn't differentiate between minor and major organs, he says you can donate, yes? He says, but after death, say the Sistani has a problem with organ donation. After what? After death. Especially some ask the question, why, for example, doesn't he allow to the non-Muslim or doesn't give preference, let's say, to the non-Muslim? Is there an issue with the non-Muslim? Or some ulama say, first give to the Muslim ahead of the non-Muslim. You find maybe because in those early fiqh texts, the non-Muslim was seen as an enemy of Islam. They weren't paying the jizya in the state. You know, there was a tax to pay in the state. So maybe the Muslim gets the preference ahead of the non-Muslim because the terminology in the books of fiqh, and that's why you come to the study of what? Text and context. Yes, the text is a thousand years old. In early Islam, a person who never paid their taxes was an enemy. Today, however, you find that someone like Sayyid Fadlallah may come to the conclusion that no, no preference Muslim or non-Muslim. If Sayyid Sistani says that, for example, there is an issue of preference, maybe Sayyid Fadlallah turns around and says what? says, no, any human being, you don't make a preference between them. You're allowed to donate in life or after death. And you can donate on which basis? He uses an ayah of the Quran. يؤثرون على أنفسهم ولو كان بهم خصاصة. Surah 59 verse 6. They give away from themselves even if it inflicts harm upon them. Please understand this ayah. Sayyid Fadallah says, Ahl al-Bayt's greatest trait was the fact they would give away from themselves even if it brought harm to themselves, yes? The idea of ethar, altruism, I will put pain on myself to help serve humanity, irrespective humanity is Muslim or Christian, they need something from me, I'll be putting myself in pain to help them. That person who Rasulullah came to Rasulullah and said, I'm hungry, Rasulullah used to do something, what did he used to say? Go to the house of Ali. You'll have food there. So he goes to the house of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib. He asks Imam Ali, he says, if I can eat in your house. Imam says, yes, you're more than welcome. Goes to Fatima Zahra, do we have any food? He says, absolutely nothing. Yes. There's only a small amount which is left. He said, very well. When I place the food, you take out the light. I'll pretend I'm eating so he can eat all the food while I stay hungry. This family, I tell you. They are in a different league to anyone else. None of us would do that. We complain if we come home and mom has no food, we'll go nuts at home, yes? Where's the food? Why is it not hot? Why is it not ready? Why is it? And Al Muhammad will pretend they're chewing as altruistic as possible. Sayyid Fadlallah says, therefore, donate in lifetime, donate after death, Muslim, non-Muslim. Sayyid Sistani says, yes, donate in your lifetime. But then after death, there may be differences depending. And Ayatollah al-Khui allows donation lifetime and after death, but has a definition on the organs. Someone asked the question, well, doesn't this bring harm to the body when we donate? I said, what if it causes harm? Say, for example, if I give a kidney away, what if it's going to cause me harm in the future, me giving this kidney away? Mark the point that's important here. What is harm according to fiqh? Yes. Harm according to fiqh is something to be studied. Firstly, there is that harm which is completely haram, the highest level of harm, which is what? Suicide. I often hear people outside the school of Hibay say, you can't do azadari. Say, why? Say, because Allah says in the Quran, you can't harm yourself. Yes, you can't harm yourself, meaning suicide. And I don't think any of us are planning on committing suicide. So you find the first type of harm is what? First time of harm is suicide. Completely haram. Why is suicide haram? Because you despair of God's mercy. The second greatest sin after shirk. You know, sometimes people come up to you and they say, you know what, I'm never going to change. I'm going hell. That's the second most blasphemous statement in Islam. Because you are saying to Allah, even you can't change me. Never say a line like that. It's the most disgusting line after shirk. Yes? Don't ever say, I'm going hell, nothing's going to change. That's disgusting. Because you're saying Allah can't change you. And Allah, in a split second, he is muqallib al qulub Yes? He's the one who rotates the heart. At split second, Hurb bin Yazid al is a hero rather than a villain. Yes? So the first type of harm, suicide. second type of harm, according to fiqh, is on the important organs. Where, if you give them away, there's a chance of disease if you injure them. Yes? If I give that eye away, if I give, for example, my hands away, there's a chance of disease that may come because of that. 
Even though Sayyid Fadlallah allows the giving away of the eye. Yes? You find that in his fiqhi opinion, he says, even the eye, if it is to do what? You see the clash that happens here? The clash happens between hurting one's body and saving one's life. He says, if it's going to save someone's life, or an alim is blind and you want to help him with his eyesight, that alim is going to serve humanity. It becomes above harming oneself. Yes. It's very intricate, the discussions. So you have harming oneself, suicide, the worst. Harm to the important organs. Yes. Then you have the third type of harm, which is less than both of these, which is allowed in Islam. The third type of harm, which is what? For example, I know when I'm eating this uh, paya, yes, or biryani from Hyderabad, yes, I know I'm harming myself. Believe me, I know. When I feed it three days later, seven days later, I know. But does it come under the classification of haram? No. It comes under the classification that you're harming yourself, but not haram. But you should look after your fitness, your health, your stamina. Yes? But you find here, if someone has a cheeseburger, you know that that cheeseburger is not the healthiest thing in the world. But that type is allowed. So what do the ulama say? If a person, for example, you say, but they're occasioning harm to themselves, not all harm is haram in Islam. There is a harm which is completely haram, a harm to the important organs. Then there's a harm which, yeah, I'm inflicting, but it's not haram. And even if you look at the idea of what is tashab, we work on the initial state in usul al-fiqh. The initial state of the person before he donated his kidney. Someone says, but you know, if he donates his kidney, at the end of the day, if he donates his kidney, they're going to be in harm later on. The initial state is there in no harm. Let's work on the initial state. Yes. The principle in usul al-fiqh, what is the principle of the principles? It's ashab. I work on the initial state of the person. The initial state when he donated his kidney. Yes, someone might say there's complications later on. I don't care necessarily about the complications later on. I'll pray to Allah that, Ya Allah, I gave away from myself. Then comes another area, which is what? All of them agree the will is important. Yes. Ayatollah al-Khu'i says you can donate your organs after death, but the will has to be there. You can't, for example, someone say, well, I think they wanted to. And that's why you find Imam Sadiq saying, Man mata bila wasiya, mata mitatin jahiliya. Whoever dies without writing their will, dies the death of a jahil. In Islam, whether it's today, tomorrow, you don't know when your last moment is. Don't say, I'm going to write my will at 78, 95. Listen, good friends of ours died too young. Yes. Good friends of ours died too young in this world. Write your will in your will. If you want to donate your organ, you refer back to your marja. What does my marja say on this issue? You will refer back, then you'll say that I want to donate my organ. Here's my will. Make sure that my will is executed. The ulama stipulate the will as being vital. Otherwise, it becomes chaos. Says he stands, he says, if a child dies and the parents, for example, are alive, they want to. No, the child hasn't said anything, you can't. Whereas Sayyid al Khamenei, for example, he says, no, the parents can take that control and they're allowed to donate. Are we allowed to, for example, take these organs in of a non-Muslim into us? Are we allowed to take them? Is, do they, are we nejis? If it's internal organs, then no, no way. External, you'll begin with that bandage and you're going to do what? Either wudu on top of it. Yes, jabira, for example. Or you're going to have to wait for a certain period of a few days before then it continues. There's no problem whatsoever. How about animals? Can I get organs from animals? There is a difference of opinion. Is that animal, the type of animal, which is A, something that can be eaten? B, is it seen as being najis? Is that because Sixth Imam would talk about the fact that certain animals, if they cannot be eaten, or they are known as ayn najis, there is a complication. Does that have to be purified, that heart of the pig that you take? Has a ghusl meant to be done? You see the ulama all di discuss all of these points. The conclusion therefore is what? The conclusion is that it's not as easy as a person saying you can donate. No, our ulama tried their best to find what could be Allah's law. Someone says, but why Sistani and Khui have a difference of opinion? Yes. When you talk in your own field, you respect the people of your field. Respect the jurists in their field. Two prophets of Allah may have a difference of opinion in the Quran. Dawood and Sulaiman. Surah 21, verse 78. Did they not have a difference of opinion within the Holy Quran? Yes. When the sheep went into the pasture, yes, they went into the pasture of the, uh, the one group of sheep, went into the farm of a farmer, 
It wasn't their farm. They went in. They started eating all the grass. Farmer came angry to Nabi Dawood. He said to him, Dawood, I want a decision made now. What's the judgment? The sheep of the next farm came into my farm. They've eaten. Nabi Dawood said, very well, then you can take the sheep. That's one judgment. Nabi Sulaiman said, in my opinion, the judgment should be, let him keep the sheep until they bring him back his benefits, his losses. They bring it back to benefits and then give the sheep back. Allah says Dawood gave an opinion. Sulaiman gave an opinion. We took Sulaiman's opinion. Does that mean Nabi Dawood was wrong? No. You may have an issue in law, two different opinions. I know Hamid Algar tried to debate whether this was permissible when it came to fiqh. He has his conclusions. We have our conclusions. The point is what? When someone says, why Sistani and Khu have differences of opinion, Dawood and Sulaiman had a difference on one issue. Did Allah say, that means Dawood is wrong? No. Dawood offered the right solution, but we feel Sulaiman offered the better. And maybe Allah's wisdom was to show that this is the success of Nabi Dawood as well. Yes? Therefore, you found that when someone comes to me in Ramadan, why do the ulama have different opinions? Dawood and Sulaiman have a different opinion. Someone comes to me, why do the ulama have different opinions? Hajj. Some of us have to sit on the bus, on top of the bus. Some of us have to sit under some maqam Ibrahim. Ulama are trying to find what could be Allah's law. Yes? Who knows what is Allah's actual law? Is whom? Is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Ahlul Bayt alayhim as -salam. The ulama struggle through the sources of law and they try to come to a conclusion. If there's a clash between harming one's body, saving someone's life, then saving someone's life always takes precedence. However, some reach the conclusion, the Muslim life is always above other lives. Others say no. The Muslim life, the other non-Muslim life, all are the same. It's the beauty of jurisprudence. Anyone who thinks all lawyers should have the same opinion has clearly never been to a court case. Yes, You can have one court case, they use the precedent of a case in 1971. On one word, they have a six-hour discussion. Isn't that true? How many times have you seen it? Don't say I've been to a courtroom, say I've seen it on the film, inshallah. Yes? One word. Did the word spy in America in 1936 in this court case mean someone who committed treason against the state or was employed by the state but had to leave his job. Word spy, seven hour discussion in the courtroom. People killing themselves, thinking let's get out. Juries thinking what am I doing here? The jurists, they have these discussions. Therefore, Islam, without a doubt in its legal system, had an ethical angle and at the same time, try to keep with the historical angle as well. Naturally, as we said in the beginning of the lecture, all the body parts speak on the day of judgment. Those who have abused their body parts without toba, then they will rise as sinners. Because the mu'min rises with his book in his right hand, yes? Whereas the one who has sinned and sinned, the body parts speak. However, you find that it's our responsibility to look after these body parts. Sometimes we take these body parts for granted that Allah has given us. Don't take them for granted. One minute you have them, another you don't. And that's why whenever you are in great shape with your body parts, always go down in sujood. Thank Allah, alhamdulillah, shukran lillah. At any second you may not have a heart that works. At any second you may not have a kidney. And at any second you may not even have eyesight. Do hamd and shukr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you have this, thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because there were people greater than you whose heart stopped working. There were people greater than you whose kidneys stopped working. And there were people greater than you. One minute their arms were with them. And the next minute their arms were not there. Yes. Salamu alayka ya abal fadl. Every time we remember him, we remember the eye of the Quran that the hands will speak on the day of judgment, won't they? Quran says, Yawma nakhtimu ala afwahihim wa tukallimuna aydihim. But who's going to hold the hands of Abel Fadl? Fatima al Zahra alayhi salam. Because Umm al Banin is Hussein's mom and Abbas's mom is Fatima, yes? Someone says, no, Fatima Zahra is Hussein's mom. No, it's as if Umm al-Banin said, Hussein's my son. And Zahra said, Abbas is my son. And the hadith say that she comes on the day of judgment with the two arms. And she complains to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who severed the arms of Abu al -Fad? Imagine Zahra. And that's why one of the ulama says, I recognize the relationship between Fatima Zahra and Abu al -Fad. They said to him, how? He said, I recognized the relationship in a dream one night. 
He said, I gave majlis on Abu al-Fadl. I saw Fatima al-Zahra in my dream. Ya Allah, allow these eyes to witness Zahra's grave, not Zahra. Let us see Fatima's grave one day. Yes. He says that in my dream, I saw Fatima al-Zahra. I saw her crying. I said to her, did I do something wrong in my musibah? She said, no. He said, then why do you cry? She said, I want you to recite something in your musibah whenever you remember Abbas. He said to her, what is it? Tell me. She said, I want you to tell every listener when he hears about Abbas that normally when someone falls from their horse, they fall with their hands in front of them. Yes. But my Abbas fell without his hands in front of him. Because he heard Sukaina say, Al-Atash, Al-Atash. And he came to Aba Abdullah. He said, Aba Abdullah, let me go out and fight. He said to him, Abbas, do this. I want you to go out and get them water. It's as if Zainab looked at his eyes the final time, yes? And it's as if she looked at him one last time and the same time Sukaina looked at him. She said, uncle, I will wait for you. He took the alam with him. He went towards the Farat. The narrations mention that his real battle wasn't Shimr bin Dil Joshan. His battle was whether he drink from the water when he was so, so thirsty. It's the jihad of the nafs is greater than the jihad of the sword. Yes, the water of the Farat is so cold. But how can I drink water and my brother drinks the syrup of death? Those were his words, yes? How can I drink water? My brother drinks from the syrup of death. The narrations mention that on his way back, he was looking towards the tent, his alam in his hands. All of a sudden, someone struck the right arm. When they struck the right arm, he said, his wonderful lines, Wallahi inqata'atumu yameeni, inni uhami abadan an deeni wa an imamin sadaq al-yaqeeni najla al-nabiy al-tahir al-ameeni Wallahi if you strike off my right hand, I will forever defend this religion and defend an imam. This is Abbas, it's all about Hussein, yes? And defend an imam who's truthful and full of certainty you found he tried to hold with the left. Someone struck him on the left. Yes. What did he call out? Ya nafs la taghshay min al-kuffar. Wa bishari bi rahmat al-jabbar. Ma'a al-nabi yis-sayyid al-mukhtar. Qad qata'u bi baghyihim yasari. He said, oh nafs, don't be scared of the kuffar. These are wonderful words. This is Abbas, yes? Oh nafs, don't be scared of the kuffar. Get ready for the mercy of the Jabbar. You're going to be with the Nabi, a Sayyid, Al-Mukhtar, the chosen prophet. Yes, they've struck off my left hand. They struck off the right, they struck off the left. There was the next moment that finished him. What was it? Harmala bin Kahil was standing next to Umar bin Sa'ad. Umar bin Sa'ad turned around to him. He said, you see him, he's lost his right. He's, left, he's lost his left, but he's still dangerous. Harmala said, what do you want? He said, take out his eye and that will be the end of him. Harmala at that moment, he put that bow and arrow back straight into the eye of Abu al-Fadl, yes? May Allah give patience to Imam Sahib al-Zaman. At this moment, he fell down. Normally when someone falls, Bibi Fatima, I say this for you. Normally when someone falls off their horse, they fall with their hands in front of them. Except Abu al-Fadl, he fell without any arms in front of him. At that moment, he called out, help me Abu Abdullah, I beg you help me. Imam al Hussein, when he ran out onto the battlefield, he saw his brother lying on the ground. He went through a number of them. All of a sudden, he stopped. Why? He saw one of the arms of Abbas on the ground. Yes. He picked it up. He continued. He saw another arm. When he got closer, Abel Fath couldn't see now. He didn't know who was around him. So, what did he call out? He said, I beg you, don't strike me until my master Hussein comes to me. Yes. But who came and held him? It was Imam al Hussein. Some people say, How did Abbas recognize Hussein? Because when Hussein kissed him, he knew it was the lips of Imam al Hussein. The Imam placed him on his lap. Abu al Fadl removed his head. He placed him again. He removed his head. Abu Abdullah looked at him. He said, Abu al Fadl, why? He said, Abu Abdullah, at this moment you have my head. 
who will hold your head in a few moments, yes? Those wonderful lines. But then the next exchange breaks the hearts of everyone. Aba Abdullah looked at Aba Al-Fadl, Aba Al-Fadl looked at Aba Abdullah. Aba Abdullah looked towards Aba Al-Fadl, he said to him, my brother, I have one wish from you. Yes. Aba Al-Fadl turned to him, he said, Bro, my master, I have one wish from you. Allahu Akbar, what do they want from each other? Aba Abdullah said to him, all your life, you've called me, Akhi, uh, you've called me Sayyidi Hussein. Yes. I beg you, I want to hear you call me Akhi Aba Abdullah. Listen, he said, all your life, you've called me my master. Just for once, I want to hear you call me my brother. Uh, what did he reply back to him? He said to him, my brother Aba Abdullah. Allahu Akbar, it's difficult to narrate. He said to him, my brother Aba Abdullah, I have one wish from you. He said, say it to me, my brother, I beg you tell me. He said, don't take me back to the tent. I promise Sakina water. How can I come back while your daughter sits in Karbala with no water? Aba Abdullah, the poet says, one more thing. He said, what is it? He said, protect Zainab. I beg you, protect her. Allahu Akbar. Look after Zainab. Make sure no one attacks her. I say to him, Ya Abel Fadla, you never saw the way Zainab ran from tent to tent. Ya Abel Fadl, you never saw the way Shimmer slapped Zainab. Ya Abel Fadla, you never saw the way they whipped Zainab on her back. Allahu Akbar. The narrations mention that the kafila returned to Medina after Karbala. Yes, they went Karbala, they went Kufa, they went Sham, they went to Karbala, they returned back to Medina. Sayyidah Zainab, she went straight to her house. She sat down. Bibi Fidda was with her. Yes. The door knocked. When the door knocked, Bibi Zainab said, I tell you, do not let anyone in. Please tell them they can't come in. When Bibi Fidda went towards the door, she opened it. She saw Umm al -Banin, the mother of Abba al she turned around to Bibi Zainab. She said to her, it's Umm al at the door. Bibi Zainab said, let her in. When Umm al saw Zainab, she said to her, wa Husayna, wa Husayna. But when Zainab saw Umm al she said to her, wa Abbasa, wa Abbasa. Continue with these, yes. Just continue with me here. A few days later, Imam Zain al Abidin asked, he said, how is Umm al-Baneen? Yes. They said to him, she's not crying for Abbas. He said to her, why? They said, because she doesn't believe Abba al-Fadl would let down Abba Abdullah. Yes, she can't accept it. He came towards her, he said to Umm al -Baneen, let me tell you what Abba al-Fadl done for Abba Abdullah. He began to tell the mother what took place. Do you know what the mother said? She said to him, oh Zain al -Abidin, I knew my son would never let Abba, Abba Abdullah down. The only reason I never cried was because I was crying about Imam Al Hussein alayhi salam. Umm al Banin would go to Jannat al Baqi every day. She would sit in Jannat al Baqi. Marwan ibn al Hakam says, even I started crying seeing Umm al Banin cry. When she'd sit in Jannat al Baqi, she'd put five houses made out of sand. Someone came to her and said, Umm al Banin, what's wrong with you? You only had four sons that died at Karbala. She said, the fifth was Abu Abdullah. How can I forget the eyes of Imam al Hussein? And that's why the poet says, Umm al Banin said, just before she died, what did she say? If you gave me all the heavens and all the earth, and you gave me 70 Abbas, I'd swap all of them to see the head of Abba Abdullah. Allahu Akbar. <laughs> Hey, hey, hey.